Good morning. My name is Claire. I'm going to be reading part of today's text. Um, we're going to start reading in Acts chapter 5, verse 12. Now many signs and wonders were regularly done among the people by the hands of the apostles, and they were all together in Solomon's portico. None of the rest dared join them, but the people held them in high esteem. And more than ever, believers were added to the Lord, multitudes of both men and women, so that, even, so that they even carried out the sick into the streets and laid them on cots and mats, that as Peter came by, at least his shadow might fall on some of them. The people also gathered from the towns around Jerusalem, bringing the sick and those afflicted with unclean spirits, and they were all healed. But the high priest rose up, and all who were with him, that is, the party of the Sadducees, and filled with jealousy, they arrested the apostles and put them in public prison. But during the night, an angel of the Lord opened the prison doors and brought them out and said, Go, and stand in the temple and speak to the people all the words of this life. And when they heard this, they entered the temple at daybreak and began to teach. This is the word of the Lord. Amen. Haley read a scripture earlier referencing uh, a parable that Jesus told um, in, in helping us to understand who God is and how he operates. And he talks about how God is, is like the shepherd that leaves the, the 99 um, in, in the open pasture and goes into the wilderness or goes seeking after the one sheep that is lost. And what I want you to know today is that that wasn't a one-time thing. That wasn't the thing that happens just when we come to faith in Christ, that he, he went and he found us and he brought us back into the fold or brought us home to be with him, but rather that's something that happens in an ongoing basis um, on, in our lives, that, that we should continually be brought back to a greater level of devotion and love and surrender to God. And the reason for that is because, because God ultimately wants what is truly good for us. He wants true and abundant life for us. And anything other than full devotion to the Lord is a cheap substitute for all that God has for us. Today, I believe that God wants to continue to pursue your heart. He wants to continue to lead you to life and to greater levels of devotion to him that you might truly experience the abundant life that is available to us in Christ Jesus. Uh, we're going to look at a text today where the gospel has come to uh, a few different groups of people uh, where God is pursuing their hearts. And we're going to look at both the gospel that was presented and ultimately we're going to see four different responses to the gospel of Jesus Christ. But I want to catch you up a little bit on where we are in Acts. Um, if you don't know the story of Acts, it is the story of Jesus Christ building his church through the power of the Holy Spirit. And so the church has been commissioned to be witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea, and Samaria, even to the ends of the earth. They've been empowered by the Holy Spirit to go out and proclaim the gospel. And when they did it, thousands of people came to faith in Jesus Christ. Now, this upset the religious rulers. Uh, a man who had been uh, lame for over 40 years had been healed. Uh, he comes into the temple, and he's leaping and jumping and rejoicing and praising God. And they say, well, whose name were you healed in? And, of course, the, the apostles are there like, oh, it was in the name of Jesus Christ, which wasn't a very popular message to the religious rulers of that day. And so they warned the disciples after imprisoning them for a bit, hey, don't speak or teach in the name of Jesus anymore. We're going we're gonna to kind of put down this rebellion or whatever this movement is in the name of Jesus. We kind of just want it to go away. But if you've been following us much in Acts, you know that it didn't go away at all. As a matter of fact, when we pick up here in chapter 5, verse 12, you're going to see that the movement has only grown. When they told them to stop speaking and teaching in the name of Jesus Christ and warned them that if they didn't, there would be consequences. They went back and they prayed, God, give us confidence to speak the word even more boldly and continue to perform signs and wonders in the name of Jesus. And that's what happened. Verse 12 says, at the hands of the apostles, many signs and wonders were taking place among the people, and they were all with one accord in Solomon's portico. The church wasn't scared, y'all. Solomon's portico, it's like the center of Jerusalem. It's about as public of a place as you could gather. And they continue to preach and teach in the name of Jesus. Signs and wonders continue to take place. 
In verse 13, but none of, none of the rest dared to associate with them. However, the people held them in high esteem. The Jews who had not believed the gospel, had not come to faith in Christ, um, they held them in high esteem. They looked at their way of life, how they cared for one another, how they shared their, their possessions, how they were uh, all in one accord. They held them in high esteem, but they're like, listen, I'm not ready to be a part of this. They kind of kept them at arm's distance. Verse 14, and all the more believers in the Lord, multitudes of men and women were constantly added to their number. If you like to do math and you're keeping a tally, uh, the last uh, hard number we got in the book of Acts was that there were over 5,000 men and women who had come to faith in Jesus Christ. Today we see that multitudes more were added to their number. And so the movement, rather than being squelched or pushed down, it's only growing more signs more wonders, more miracles, more converts. The gospel message just keeps going, and they're still in the temple preaching in the name of Jesus. It must have really upset the religious rulers. But it went even further than that, because the gospel had not stopped in the city of Jerusalem. Look here in verse 15. It says, To such an extent that they even carried the sick out into the streets and laid them on cots and pallets, so that when Peter came by, at least his shadow might fall on any one of them. And also, the people from the cities in the vicinity of Jerusalem were coming together, bringing people who were sick or afflicted with unclean spirits, and they were all being healed. So now, it's not just Jerusalem this thing's happening. People are gathering from the other cities, and they're, they're bringing their sick, and they're beginning to line the streets with these people in hope that maybe even the shadow of Peter might touch them, that they might experience the same level of healing that they'd heard about other people experiencing in the name of Jesus Christ. Now, I would point this out as a rather extraordinary act of belief, of faith, in the power of God to heal. Now, there's nothing in this text that tells us that people were actually healed when Peter's shadow touched them, but they knew that when Peter proclaimed healing in the name of Jesus, it changed people's lives. And so the question I would ask for us as disciples a couple thousand years later, do you believe in the same power in the name of Jesus Christ that led people to lay their sick in the streets, hoping that just the shadow of someone who could proclaim his name over them might bring healing to them. Y'all, just as the early church was called to be witnesses, we too have been called to be witnesses. Slightly different setting, right? A little different time, um, millennia even. But we've been called to be the church for such a time as this in the day in which we live. Now, in verse 17, you're going to see that the religious leaders, the Sadducees, the Pharisees, they weren't very happy that the streets are now lined with people wanting to have Jesus intervene in their lives, that people are coming from the surrounding districts just to hear about Jesus and to experience the signs and wonders that were being performed. And so they're a little bit upset about it. Verse 17 says, But the high priest rose up along with all his associates, that is the sect of the Sadducees, and they were filled with jealousy. They laid hands on the apostles and they put them in a public jail. But during the night, an angel of the Lord opened the gates of the prison, taking them out. He said, go stand and speak to the people in the temple, the whole message of this life. Do you believe that the gospel is a message of life? Not just like one-time salvation that maybe when you die one day, you can be with Jesus in heaven, but rather it's the message of life. It is the greatest possible life that you could live today as well, and you can begin to walk in that. Go and proclaim the message of life. So this is a, a unique circumstance. Um, they're in prison for preaching the gospel. An angel comes, opens the doors, however he does that, tells them to go preach in the temple, and they, that's exactly what they did. They went back to the place where they had previously been arrested. And so upon hearing this, they entered the temple about daybreak. They began to teach. Now, when the high priest and his associates came, they called the council together, even all the senate of the sons of Israel, and sent orders to the prison house for them to be brought. There was a problem. They weren't there. But the officers who came did not find them in the prison, but they returned and reported back, saying, We found the prison house locked quite securely and the guards standing at the doors, but when we had opened up, we found no one inside. And when the captain of the temple guard and the chief priest heard these words, they were greatly perplexed about them as to what would come of this. Remember what happened on Pentecost? When the Spirit fell and people spoke in tongues that they didn't know and everyone heard the gospel, the mighty works of God in their own language? 
Do you remember the stir that was caused when the man who had been lame since birth, that was over 40 years old, when he was healed and he was running and leaping through the temple and people are trusting in Jesus Christ? Do you remember the stir that was caused after we imprisoned Peter and John and they said, hey, should we obey you rather than God? I don't think so. And they just kept preaching. They're perplexed, like, hey, we put these guys in jail and they've been miraculously delivered. They don't know how it happened any more than you or I do, but they're like, hey, what's this going to bring? Verse 25, but someone came and reported to them, the men whom you put in prison are standing in the temple uh, teaching the people. And the captain went along with all the officers and proceeded to bring them back without violence, for they were afraid of the people that they might be stoned. Remember, the disciples, they've got the favor of the people. They're admiring the early Christians, the love that they had for one another. So they were afraid of the people that they might be stoned. But when they brought them, they stood them before the council, and the high priest questioned them, saying, We gave you strict orders not to continue teaching in this name, and yet you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching and intend to bring this man's blood upon us. And you're working your dead level best to make us guilty of crucifying the Messiah. Like you want to paint us to be the sinful ones for putting Jesus to death, which is what they were, but they didn't want to believe that at this point. The Peter and the apostles answered, We must obey God rather than men. The God of our fathers raised up Jesus, whom you had put to death by hanging him on a cross. He is the one whom God exalted to his right hands as a prince and a savior to grant repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. And we are witnesses of these things, and so is the Holy Spirit, whom God has given to those who obey him. Now, there's a little bit more to the story, but I want to I point out four different responses to the gospel that we see in this text. Now, I, I've kind of laid out for you the miracles that have happened in the city of Jerusalem, that every opportunity they got, the apostles have been preaching in the temple, proclaiming the kingdom of God, that Jesus was the Messiah. So they'd seen the miracles, and they'd heard the teaching. And I believe that God was pursuing their hearts in the same way that God continues to pursue our hearts. The first response that we see up in verse 13 is that of reverent rejection. They heard the gospel, they saw the miraculous signs, and yet they rejected. They didn't trust Jesus Christ. They didn't believe that true life was found in him. They ultimately believed that life was somewhere else. The, the people who heard the gospel in verse 13, none of the rest, whoever they were, likely Jews who had been around the temple and they'd seen the man jumping and leaping after being healed. They'd heard the gospel preached, but none of the rest dared to associate with him. However, the people held them in high esteem, and they appreciated the way of life. These were probably Jews who believed in God, by the way. They would have called him Father. They knew some of the scriptures. There would have been levels, various levels of devotion uh, you know, present within this community. And yet upon hearing that the Messiah had come and that he had went to the cross for their sins, that they might have new life for whatever reason, these people are like, no, I'm not ready to go there. I'm not ready to be a part of those people. Uh, I'm not going to associate myself with them. I appreciate their way of life. They've got good morals. They're, they're solid people. Uh, you know, Whatever they might have said about them. Um, but they reverently rejected the gospel. They'd seen the miracles. They'd heard as Peter and John laid out the scriptures pointing to Jesus as the Messiah. But they were unwilling to give up their lives that they were currently living. Now, some of this might have been, might have been due to the fact that the chief priests and the scribes had threatened people who were followers of the way. Don't you keep teaching and preaching in the name of Jesus. And don't be a part of the way, right? Don't be a follower of Jesus Christ or else. And so maybe some of them were afraid of the, the civil consequences if they had become followers of Jesus. Um, some of them may have heard the story of Ananias and Sapphira and heard how hypocrisy had been dealt with with death. I'm not sure I want to be a part of that yet. And yet at the end of the day, you have people who knew the name of God who would have called him God, and yet they rejected the gospel of Jesus Christ and decided to go their own ways. Now, a modern-day correlation to that, what that might look like today um, in our day and age, 
It was someone who believes in God, right? Because we live in LaFleur County and everybody believes in God, right? I mean, that's, that's what we do. That's kind of who we are. We're Southern Americans. We, we believe in God and we carry guns and whatever other things that we do in the South, right? People that would believe in God, appreciate His power, and maybe be the type of person that would pray when someone's sick, put it on Facebook, hey, pray for us, whatever. But as someone who's never to this point submitted to the lordship of Jesus Christ in their life, it's a reverent rejection. It's not that we say there is no God or I don't, I don't want any part of God. It's just I'm not ready to quite follow him yet. It's this reverent rejection of God. I, I like God. I'm just not into church. Or I don't want to be a hypocrite and I'm not ready to change my life. Maybe people today in reverent rejection would say, I still do things that I know God doesn't want me to do and I don't want to be the hypocrite. And so, not today, God. I'm not ready to trust in you. I'm not ready to follow after you. I like God. I believe he exists. But I also love my life as it is, my rights, and I like my stuff too much. They weren't willing to follow themselves because they believed the costs were too high. So they held them in high esteem, but they kept their distance. They didn't join with the followers of Jesus Christ and become a part of the church. The second type of rejection that we see in this story is that of prideful, self-righteous rejection. Let me just say, this one is all around us. We may not know it, but if you've been raised in a moral culture, you've been around church for much of your life, this is all around us. We see this in the chief priests and the scribes and the Sadducees and the Pharisees. Now, these men, they were more studied in the law than the average person. They knew the scriptures. They could quote the verses. They, too, had seen the miracles. These men had heard the testimony of Peter and John about the gospel of Jesus Christ. They'd heard it firsthand. They'd seen the man in the temple who had been healed. And they heard as they reasoned from the scriptures, Oh, I know that verse that points toward the Messiah. And yet for them, they rejected the gospel of Jesus Christ. They rejected the idea that they were sinners who were in desperate need of a Savior, but God had provided that Savior in the person of Jesus Christ and his work on the cross. They rejected that because they were too busy trusting in their own works. If you were a good Jew in the first century, you would have thought, when you thought about you and God, you would have immediately looked through the lens of the law, and you would have said, how well have I kept the law? And let me just tell you, the scribes and the Pharisees, they were good at it, and everyone knew it. Y'all, they tithed off of their mint and their dill and their cumin, like they tied their spices. They were really, really exacting about following what the law said. They were pretty good at it. And because they were pretty good at following the law, because they thought they were good enough, they didn't feel like they needed a Savior. They weren't looking for the Messiah who could rescue them from their sins. They thought they were pretty good people. Listen, I, I know the Bible. I'm a pretty good person. Why well, get fanatical about this man named Jesus? Jesus. Self-righteousness is believing that God owes you something because of your own righteousness, because of your own deeds. I've been good enough, so God should bless me. I've lived a pretty good life, so God should save me. This is the most common thing I hear when I speak to people in our community. And I ask them about, you know, their relationship with Christ. You know Jesus Christ. Like if you, if you were to die and you stood before God, what reason would you give him why he should let you into heaven? Well, I've been pretty good. I've gone to church. And they begin to list all of the good things they've done throughout their life, thinking that maybe if they have enough good things, it'll outweigh the bad things and God will somehow let them in. Now, the sobering, painful truth of that, Romans 3.23 tells us, that every single one of the scribes and the Pharisees, as good as they were, they had sinned and they had fallen short of the glory of God. It was true of them and it's true of us, even good old LaFleur County people. When we look at ourselves in the mirror, 
And we have a tendency to pat ourselves on the back. You know, when you do good, when your spouse is kind of rude to you and you're not rude back, you're like, yeah, I'm killing this. I'm getting better, right? Or maybe you help somebody out in the community and you're like, maybe give a little bit of money. Or, you, you know, you do the good things. You think, man, God must be really proud of me. Now, the trouble with, with thinking through a lens of the law and whatever standard of goodness that we might adopt is that we also fail at that sometimes. And sometimes we just straight up yell back at our spouse, don't we? Or we drive past the person who's in need. And when we fail to meet the standard, it is the, the weight that crushes us again. And we, we think terribly of ourselves and God must be upset at me now. That's a prideful rejection of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Self-righteousness says, I deserve to go to heaven on the basis of what I've done. The gospel of Jesus Christ says, you are welcome to go to heaven, trusting not in what you've done or not done, but trusting in what Jesus Christ has done on your behalf. Yes, we are all sinners and fall short of the glory of God, but Jesus Christ came and he lived a perfect, sinless life. And he went to the cross to bear the just punishment for our sin and credits that righteousness to us so that our standing is no, before God is no longer on the basis of some moral standard. Our standing before God is not on the basis of how well we perform today or yesterday or next week. Our standing before God is cemented by the work of Jesus Christ on the cross. Your sin has been taken away and righteousness has been granted. Now, today... I don't know very many people at all that try to live up to the Old Testament law, like that standard. You know, don't wear garments of two different types of fabric and all the things that you see listed there. Today, the moral standards are a little different. And to be honest with you, they vary person to person. What makes a person good or bad? Today, it might sound like this. People trying to do good as they see it. I'm a non-judgmental person. And the subtle thinking is... If I don't judge other people, maybe God won't judge me. Maybe I'm a really accepting person. I accept all kinds of people, and the hope there is that if I accept all kinds of people, then God should accept me. Maybe you're a loving kind of person. I love everybody, and so maybe God will accept me. Maybe you're a person who likes to do social good. I've done good to other people, so maybe God will do good to me. A self-righteous response to the gospel says, I'm justified before God on the basis of what I have done. True acceptance of the gospel says, I'm justified before God on the basis of what Jesus Christ has done. What we recognize in the gospel is that the only thing we brought to the table in our relationship with God was our sin. But because of the gospel of Jesus Christ, we can be saved and we can begin to live this new life. These religious men who had devoting their, devoted their entire lives to religion to practicing Judaism, studying the law. They rejected the gospel because they were too proud to acknowledge that they were sinners. In verse 28, they say to the apostles, you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching and you intend to bring this man's blood on us. How dare you try to make us out to be sinful? We're good guys, right? We keep the law better than everybody. Like we, we Look, look, Mint, Dill, and Cumin, y'all, we check the boxes. We're trying to make us sinners. It was a prideful rejection of the gospel. The third type of rejection that we see in this story uh, begins in verse 33. It's with a, a teacher named Gamaliel. Now, if the Jews knew a little bit of Judaism and the scribes and the Pharisees knew quite a bit more, Gamaliel was the leading scholar in all of Judaism at this time. I mean, he was kind of the, the, the most uh, well-known thinker. The Apostle Paul kind of bragged as he's bolstering his Jewish credentials. He says, I was trained under Gamaliel. And this guy, he was the best thinker of our time. He knew the word better than everyone. He, he could translate the, the scriptures better than everyone. He was the guy. And yet I want you to see how Gamaliel rejected the gospel of Jesus Christ. Read with me in verse 33. It says, when they heard the gospel, once again, by the way, when they heard this, they were cut to the quick and intended to kill the apostles. 
But a Pharisee named Gamaliel, a teacher of the law, respected by all the people, he stood up in the council and he gave orders to put the men outside for a short time. And he said to him, Men of Israel, take care what you propose to do with these men. For some time ago, Theudas rose up claiming to be somebody, and a group of about 400 men joined up with him. But he was killed, and all who following, followed him were dispersed, and it came to nothing. Hey, we, we've seen some uprisings like this before. Remember Theudas? He had a following. Some people came after him. They were all excited about it. But then Theudas died, and they all fell away. He points to another example. And he says, after this, in verse 37, a man named Judas of Galilee rose up in the days of the census, and he drew away some people after him. And he, too, perished, and all who followed him were scattered. So in the present case, here's Gamaliel's response. Rather than acknowledge the weight of the miraculous that he'd seen, and these guys were in prison, and somehow they're out teaching on the streets of the temple again. Man, the guy was lame from birth, rode for 40 years, and he's walking. Rather than evaluate the claims that they'd made as to the Messiahship of Jesus Christ based upon the Scriptures, rather than say, hey, what, what does the Word of God say? We've heard the gospel. What does this mean for us? You know what Gamaliel did? He's like, you know, let's just kind of wait and see. I'm not really ready to get on board with that. Now, here's the thing. If you're a good teacher, you're, you're the leading thinker in all of Judaism, you would think that you could evaluate the claims and, and objectively say, hey, this is either true or it's false. And if it's false, you just crucified Jesus for claiming to be the king of the Jews, right? You just crucified Jesus for claiming to be the son of God. Why go easy on these men? But Gamaliel... Rather than commit to one course of action or another, follow Jesus or put these men to death, hey, let's just wait and see how it plays out. I've got some lingering questions, some more things I'd like to hear. I want to do a little more investigation. Um, I'm not really ready to make a judgment about these guys yet. And so here's what he proposed. In the present case, I say to you, stay away from these men and let them alone. For if this plan or action is of men, it will be overthrown. But if it is of God you will not be able to overthrow them, or else you may even be found fighting against God. Good news here. They took his advice, and after calling the apostles in, they flogged them and ordered them not to speak in the name of Jesus, and then they released him. Gamaliel represents a different type of rejection. It's not a reverent rejection in the same way that the crowds weren't going to get involved with it at all. It wasn't the prideful rejection of most of the Pharisees. Instead, I called it an agnostic uh, rejection. The, the word agnostic, it comes from the Greek word gnosis, without knowledge. It was, I'm not sure yet. You know, I need a little more information before I can make my judgment. I'm, I'm going to wait and see. Maybe someday I'll get there and, and, and then I'll be able to follow Jesus, but not today. We're just going to kick the can down the road a little bit. An agnostic rejection of the gospel. Now, this looks a little bit different for us. Maybe you've been around church for a lot of years. You've even seen God work in some ways. But you've never said, hey, is this true? Is this true in my life? And is there really a God? And am I really a sinner? Is there really a heaven and a hell and an eternity? And maybe for you, you've heard this message your whole life. You've just been kicking the can down the road. You've never chosen to engage and say, God, would you show me if you're real? Would you, would you save me? Or just decided, you know what? He's not real and walked away. But instead, you've just been kicking the can down the road day after day after day. Gamaliel had seen and heard enough. He's a leading thinker in all of Judaism. He'd seen and heard enough. And yet he rejected the gospel. He failed to find the life that was available to him. God was pursuing his heart in the same way that he's pursuing ours, wanting to lead him to life. And yet he rejected it on this day. The fourth response to the gospel that we see is the gospel that we want to see, uh, or is the response that we want to see in every one of our lives. It's what we hope for. And this is the response that we would commit ourselves to every single day of our lives, that we might know the fullness of joy that is available to us in Christ Jesus. And that is wholehearted devotion. It is authentic acceptance of the gospel of Jesus Christ where we begin to find life in him and not in the things of this world. Y'all, check this out. These people who came to faith, right? 
who were followers of the way, the multitudes who came in, uh, they did so knowing that there was a legal threat to their lives. There were already people who had been in prison for believing and teaching the things that they were supposed to believe and teach. Look at, look at the response of the disciples, um, even when they were called into prison. Stop preaching and teaching. It's like, no, we can't. We're beholden to God. We have found the treasure that was hidden in the field, which is worth losing everything that we had in our lives, that we might have this one thing. They were wholeheartedly devoted to God. So even in the midst of imprisonment and threats, they were not about to back down. In verse 41, it says, So they went on their way after being flogged, which is uh, the, the Jewish prescription for the maximum punishment, which was 40 lashes minus one. So 39 times the whip had come across their back and ripped their flesh. They were bloodied and bruised for the sake of the gospel. And look at their response. So they went on their way from the presence of the council rejoicing that they had been considered worthy to suffer shame for his name. And every day, back in the temple and from house to house, They kept right on teaching and preaching Jesus as the Christ. When we come to faith in Christ, when we understand the gospel, we understand that we have found that thing which is worth the loss of all other things. That we would give up our life, that we might truly find it in him. Here's what I would want you to know today. Jesus Christ wants to lead you to a life that is beyond description, which is beyond anything that this world could ever provide you. A life that would say, hey, hey, it doesn't matter the things of this world, what I have or what I don't have. It doesn't matter if I'm free or if I'm in prison. It doesn't matter if I'm sitting at home in comfort or if I'm being beaten. I have joy because of the gospel of Jesus Christ, because I found the thing that was worth the loss of all other things, the one thing that matters both now and for all eternity, and I've found true life in him. It's wholehearted devotion. We live in a country where uh, I don't think you're going to be beaten for teaching and preaching in Jesus' name. As a matter of fact, we've been called to be witnesses just as they were then, and we're free to do so. Wholehearted devotion today looks like loving the Lord your God with all your heart and your soul, your mind and your strength, loving your neighbor as yourself. That that would be the sole basis of your life. That Yeah, you work a job and you, you go throughout this life, but your purpose is to love God and to bring him glory among the people. And so today, wholehearted devotion means repenting of our sin, if you've never trusted in Jesus Christ, repenting of your sin and asking God to save you, recognizing that you're a sinner who's in need of a Savior, not rejecting the gospel or kicking the can down the road any longer, but trusting in Jesus to save you. It looks like saying no to competing interests to gather regularly with the church of God where the word is going to be proclaimed and the body might be built up. It's prioritizing participation in community with other believers, gathering house to house. It means investing your time and treasure into the kingdom of God, prioritizing a significant time of prayer uh, in prayer and in the word each day. And it means being a witness of Jesus Christ, no matter the cost. If it's discomfort, we count it joy that we could suffer discomfort for the name of Jesus Christ. And if one day it was imprisonment, We would count it joy. If one day it was, you know, some sort of of, of beating or abuse, we would count it joy. This is the purpose for why we were created, to know God and to make him known in the world. Today I want to invite you to not settle for a cheap imitation of that, but to surrender your whole life to Jesus Christ. Would you bow with me? Father, every act of obedience in the Christian life is initiated by you. God, you're the one who left the 99 and you've come after us. God, you're bringing us back to fellowship with you. You're bringing us back that we might live a true life in you, not in the empty things of this world, but in the fullness of life in you. So God, I pray that today, just as you've done millions of times since the scriptures that we're reading today, that you would begin to speak to hearts, that you would point out the sinful tendencies, the things that we're clinging to rather than experiencing true and full life in you. 
God, for the person who's here who's been kicking the can down the road and they've never just gone full in to trust in you and give their whole life to you, I I pray that today would be the day of salvation. For the person who can't seem to find time to spend time with you in your word or in prayer, God, I pray that you would show them the idols that exist in their heart, the other things that they're pursuing first. Lord, it's my prayer that today would be the day of repentance. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.